song here, um, but I just want you guys to remember, you know, at any time um, in which you feel distant from the Lord, if you feel like you've fallen away, um, there's always an opportunity to come back to God, and we just pray here this morning that um, anyone who has felt that way uh, will be able to take this time um, to just come back to the Lord and, uh, and worship Him in this time. Let's get to you, worshiping.
heads with me in prayer. Father God, we just pray, Lord, that as we just sang, we can come to you as we are, that you will meet us where we're at, that you will remind us of your love and the things you've done for us, remind us of your gospel, bring us back into a good relationship with you, and help us walk beside you all the days of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. And uh, now you guys can take this time uh, to just greet each other. Um, if you're at home uh, watching the live chat, um, feel free to use the live chat box to, to say hello to one another. And we'll hear from Dr. Ray in just a moment. Okay, let's all. One, two. Let's all get back together. We good? All right, let's all meet back together. This way. Robert, we're good? All right, good. Thanks so much for being with us this weekend. This is our fifth and final session of this year's fall conference. For some of you, this is your first session. It might even be your second session, uh, but that's okay because you can go back to our website or to our app and tap or click into uh, the previous sessions. So Dr. Ray has been talking about engaging our culture. been a part of Bread of Life Church, what would you say? It's completely countercultural. Is this mic on? We're good? Okay, go ahead. Oh, that's it. That's it? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's less than 30 seconds, all right. It's... I think... Somebody appreciates that brevity is a virtue. Definitely. No, it is. It, it, sexuality in the New Testament era turned the Greco, the Christian view of sexuality turned the Greco Roman world upside down. Almost everything about the New Testament's view of sexuality was totally countercultural in the first century. And I think it's the same today. Well, thanks again for being with us this weekend, and we look forward to uh, this final presentation. Thanks. I will expand on that just a little. <laughs> uh, hey, just a, I want to make a, just a little bit of a bridge, since I, I think this is the student section over here. Uh, great, grateful that you all are here, and uh, there were a number of you who were here Friday night, too, for our discussion of artificial intelligence, which was really fun having you all here. Because I think the, the best questions definitely came from the student section. Amen? Because uh, they are the most familiar with the technology. Uh, but one of the, what we talked about this morning, just, just briefly earlier, had to do with the Christian view, biblical view of work and calling and vocation. And I, I didn't make the bridge to students like I, like I wanted to. But this, this is, even though you know, you, you're not out working full time, uh, at, at least doesn't look like you are, uh, <laughs> but you, all, all of you will be at, at likely at some point. And the, the point that I wanted to make this, this morning was that what the, what the Bible teaches is that God, God calls people to various occupations, whether it's in you know, in the sciences or in business or in healthcare or, you know, other, ty or other, other really any other type, type of legitimate work, 
analogous to the way he calls men and women to the pastorate, to the mission field, things like that. The, the Bible, Bible does not teach that there's a hierarchy of callings. One of the great legacies of the Re- that the Reformation left to us was the idea of a worldly call, quote, worldly calling, that you did not have to be, uh, you did not have to be getting a paycheck from, from a church or another Christian organization to be doing something significant for God's kingdom. Uh, so in the, the, what the Bible teaches is, is that our work was, was ordained prior to the general entrance of sin, and it, is, and it therefore has intrinsic value and, is, and is, a, is an essential part of our service to Christ. So uh, what I want to, the encouragement to students is, you know, if, 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 you, have, if you have a passion for a particular area of study uh, or a, you know, a partic- particular thing, all, all, all my, three, my three boys, they're all artists of one sort or another. Uh, and last time I checked, they were all solvent which I'm very, I'm very encouraged about. Uh, but they, they have felt a definite sense of calling to do what they are doing as artists. My, my oldest son produces commercials. My middle son's an audio engineer in the music business. My youngest son is, is an actor in New York. Uh, so we'll, you know, what, 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 they, what, what they struggled with was to connect their faith to the thing that they were most passionate about. And you, you have your, the things you're passionate about are not an accident. And in most cases, I think, ref, are, are a reflection of some of the things, some of the ways that God has wired you and some of the things that he might be calling you to do with the majority of your waking, waking hours uh, when school is done. So for now, you, you're, you're, your calling is to be a student and to pursue that with excellence. Um, and you know, if, if God calls, we're, we're in whatever arena of service, whatever occupation uh, God puts on your heart, know that in, in the scripture, that's a, that is a fully, uh, fully valuable and intrinsically worthy means of serving Christ. Right now, when we come to questions, if you want to ask some questions about that in, in a bit, I'd be happy to take a few questions. But I, w- I really wanted to close the loop with students on that because that was that was a missing piece from this morning. All right, now on to sexuality. <laughs> now that I have your attention, um, it it would be it would be hard to understate how revolutionary the New Testament teaching on sexuality was in the Greco-Roman world. Now, for, for example, basically in the, in, in the Greco-Roman world, men could do whatever they wanted sexually. There were virtually no, there, there was no shame in hardly anything that men could do sexually. Uh, <clears throat> the Greco-Roman world was the same kind of sexual smorgasbord available like there is, like there is any metro, major metropolitan area around the world today. Uh, adultery was not, was not considered um, out of the ordinary uh, for, for men. For women, it was completely prohibited. Uh, women were viewed as the property of men in the ancient world, children even more so. Um, the, the sanctity of life for children was not taken particularly seriously it was not uncommon in the first century for, for uh, newborn babies and young children just to be left uh, and abandoned by their parents if they could no longer support them. Uh, there was no, no system for adoption or you know, foster care, or any, anything like that in the Greco-Roman world. Um, uh, their pe- pedophilia was rampant and totally acceptable in the Roman world. Uh, household servants, both male and female, uh, were subject to basically non-consensual sex whenever their masters wanted. Um, and there was, there was no real distinction made between opposite sex and same sex sexual relations in the Greco-Roman world. Um, 
So the, the, about, about the only thing that there were just a handful of things that were considered out of bounds uh, in, in the first century, but uh, for men. And virtually any sexual activity outside of marriage for women, other than prostitution, was considered out of bounds. And the reason for that was not because it violated the marriage covenant, but because someone else was stealing your wife. It was a violation of the moral principle of private property more than anything else. So when the, when the Apostle Paul came along and called men and women both to sexual fidelity in marriage, the, for women that was no big change, but for men, they, the, for men, it was like this radical notion. And so in the first century, the, the testimony to the gospel of men who were faithful to their wives was this incredibly powerful witness to how transforming the gospel was. Because it, in, in the view of the culture, it, tra- it had transformed men in their, in their deepest emotions and affections. Um, and... And when you know, and when, so when the, when the New Testament describes, um, you know, t- takes pedophilia off the table, uh, and takes prostitution off the table, uh, you know, the, the culture looked at the church, wondering, you know, what what on earth is wrong with you people? And and so, it, but what they discovered is that their marriages, what a shock, turned out to be better. What a surprise that marital fidelity tends to make for better marriages. Um, but I, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, this, this is one of the reasons why the New Testament had a lot to say about sex. Because sex, it was so rampant and so perverse in the first century that all sorts of corrections were needed. So for just one example of, well, let me give you a couple, I guess a couple examples of things that I think summarize the New Testament teaching on this. The first one of these comes from uh, Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 6. I realize I'm turning pages in a Bible. If you don't know what that is, (laughs) you're excused. Uh, So this is beginning in verse, verse 12. It said, I have the right to do anything quote, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, which was basically the view of sexuality held by men in the first century. But I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food and God will destroy them both. But the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Okay, now, what, that, what, that, what we take from that is that we are more than just souls on a stick. Our bodies matter. Our bodies have eternal significance. What we do with our bodies is not inconsequential. Okay. And the, the definition of sexual immorality got hugely expanded in the first century for men. So by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies of members are Christ himself? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Don't you know that whoever unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Therefore, you, are bought, you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So that last part, so much for my body, my choice. Okay. Now, the, the, point, the point, if you look carefully, the point of the passage is that sexual immorality violates our relationship with all three members of the Trinity. It's, as, it's about as complete a statement as Paul can make. 
It's in verse 14, for by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. He will raise us also. He, sexual immorality violates our relationship with God the Father who will raise us from the dead. And the idea is that your body, your body's not going to burn when you die. Your body's going to be resurrected and, you, and you, will, you will have your body for eternity. Therefore, what you do with your body now matters for eternity. Okay. Second, sexual immorality violates our relationship with God the Son. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Okay. And then finally, it violates our relationship with God the Holy Spirit. In verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. And that, I think, that, that's probably the most countercultural thing about both, both the New Testament teaching in the first century and today. Because in the New Testament era, men's bodies were completely their own. They could do with them what they want. Women's bodies belonged to their husbands. And so the, the idea, this was actually incredibly liberating for women to hear this said to men that you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And in today's culture, we live, we are shot through with this culture of individual autonomy where it's my life, it's my body, it's my decisions, it's my, my, my. It's all about me being true to me and to myself. And the worst sin of our culture today is to not be authentic, not be your authentic self and to follow your heart. Okay? But let me, just let me remind you what the, what the Bible teaches about the condition of our heart. You know, Jeremiah was very, the heart is deceptive. Your heart can lead you astray. My, my guess is that if all of us followed our heart every time we had an urge, all of our lives would be train wrecks. I mean, and part of, the, part of the whole function of ethics and morality is to help us to put boundaries around what our heart tells us to do. Okay, now if they're saying things you're passionate about, that's different. But if, 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 if by that it means follow your, follow your urges, follow your desires, okay, I would suggest that theologically speaking, that's, that's, just, that's not true. I think, I think just as far as advice goes, that's terrible advice. Because you know, your, heart, your heart can lead you astray. And your conscience is not infallible. Right? You, you, your, conscience will, your conscience can lead you astray too. Your conscience was subject to sin like every other part of you. And the Bible talks about your conscience being seared and being useless. And your conscience needs to be educated. Your, your heart needs to be educated. And we spend... We spend you know, we spend a good bit of our, of our lives thinking about the, the limits that morality puts on our, our, our ability and our inclination to, quote, follow our desires. Okay, you with me, you with me on that? I, you know, give me, don't hear me out. Don't, don't hear me as saying that your desires don't matter. Because you know, we can have good desires, but some of our desires have been disordered by sin. And so lots, lots of our desires are good, but you, ch you check those by our understanding of Scripture, by what it means to be faithful to Christ. Okay, so don't, don't, don't hear me as this sort of cosmic killjoy here <laughs> saying you can't, you, can't, you, know, you can't pursue your heart's desire. You can, you, are, you can pursue what you're passionate about, but I would say don't, don't always trust your desires. Okay, you with me on that? Okay. Now, the other, the other passage of Scripture that I, th that I think re reflects why marriage and sexuality is so important is in the book of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 5, 
it puts it like this, beginning in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing of water through the word to prevent her, present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or, or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, us husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Okay. After all, no one hates his own body, but they care and feed for their body as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For, we are, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Okay. There's something about marriage between a man and a woman and how they relate to each other that is a powerful testimony of how God loves each of us. That's the, that's the design. Ultimately, that's the reason God designed marriage like he did. So that the way husbands and wives relate to each other in marriage is to illustrate and to be this, this beautiful canvas painting of how Christ loves each of us individually. Right? Now, I gotta, I gotta say, we don't, we, we don't always do a great job of illustrating that. And how this works out in practice sometimes is not quite the way we hoped it would be. But this is, this is ultimately, I think, the reason why this conversation about sexuality is so important. And why the notion, the biblical notion of marriage being between one man and one woman is so, is so important theologically. Right? Now I know culturally, people think we're nuts on this. People think we're bigots and outdated and, and, and obsolete. But the, the scripture, I think, is really clear. And think, think about how, how countercultural this was. For husbands to, to have the mandate on them to love their wives like Christ loved the church, to be sacrificial, even to the point of giving up their lives for their wives. I mean, that, you know, you could just see men's heads exploding when they heard that for the first time. Because hus husbands understood themselves as owners of their wives. And the idea that they had any obligation to love their wives, I mean, that would have been huge breaking news to most men in the ancient world. Now, every, every once in a while, they did. You know, people actually did fall in love in the ancient world from time to time, although most, most marriages were arranged. But it was, it's really, I think it's really important that we see how, how different that was in the first century. Okay, enough on that. Um, now, a couple, here's a couple of comments when it comes to same-sex marriage and, and same-sex sexuality. Um, I think it's really, it's, it's really important that we d d differentiate between the attraction and the behavior, right? The attraction is one thing. What the Bible is concerned about is the, be is the sexual behavior that follows from the attraction. Okay? Now, for, for example, um, well, let me put it this way. The, the attraction, whether it's for the same sex or the opposite sex, I wanna, I wanna argue is morally neutral. And, and someone with a same sex attraction is fully capable of following Christ faithfully and being in obedience to scripture. Right? So it, what, what the Bible holds us accountable to are the things that we actually make decisions about. In sexuality, when attraction gives way to lust, lust is a decision that you make. 
Basically, lust is, as, as my, my former pastor put it, lust is the decision to envision yourself as the main character in a pornographic movie. Okay? That's a decision to make. Okay? And then further acting out on that lust is also a decision that's made. That's a choice that's made. Okay? In most cases... The, the attraction, whether you are attracted to someone of the same sex or opposite sex, is not a choice. Okay? Now, it's not to, that's not to say that you're born that way either, necessarily. Okay? Because, uh, you know, let's, just, let's put it this way. There are, some, there, are some, there are some men and women who have never known anything else but an attraction to the same sex. Now, how, how, that, how that unfolds and develops, we could spend a whole lot of time on that. But suffice it to say that in the vast majority of cases, whether you have an opposite sex or same-sex attraction, that's not a choice and is not something that God holds us accountable to. Now, to be clear, it's not, it's, it's not the way God designed it. God, God's design from Genesis 1 was for opposite sex attraction. And I think the scripture views same-sex attraction as one of the consequences of the general entrance of sin into the world. I'm not saying it's their personal sin, although I think in some cases people develop a same-sex attraction by virtue of being sinned against by someone else. Okay? But that's, sort of, that's more speculation. So... It, 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 is, it is entirely possible, in my view, for someone who is same-sex attracted and who makes choices about lust and further acting out sexually to be, and makes the right choices to, be, to, be, to walk faithfully with Christ. I mean, I've got, I've got several good friends who are same-sex attracted and they have chosen to remain celibate in terms of their sexual behavior. And one, one, of, these, one of these people is, is very close to me. Um, and they've chosen to remain celibate out of a desire to please God. Okay? Now, I realize, culturally speaking, that's a big ask for people. But remember, almost everything in terms of sexuality, was a huge ask for people in the first century. All right, and, and what we just read in Ephesians 5 and how that connects with, our, with the, the, the illustration of Christ's love for the church, I think that, that, that keeps it from being a side issue that doesn't matter much where we can just agree to disagree. I think that, I think I think it really is a, a central aspect to the teaching of Scripture. All right. Now, transgender is a whole other ball game that we were totally unprepared for, especially in, in recent years. What's called rapid with this rapid onset gender dysphoria is. And we were completely unprepared for that. So, I, because, and again, our, the, our theology helps us here. Because I, I am convinced that gender dysphoria is a real thing. And it's a, it's a um, it, it can be a debilitating real thing. And we've seen, especially, especially in the last five years or so, the vast majority of people who are, ex who are experiencing gender dysphoria are adolescent girls. And, and the, the majority of, of gender transitions that are being done are the female to male transitions. All right, so here's, I, th I think the way, the way the Bible addresses gender dysphoria, I don't, I don't think, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised that it's a thing. 
because if, the, if, if, our, if our understanding of, of our doctrine of sin is correct, then sin affected not only our relationships with each other, but the general interest of sin and its pervasiveness in our world today has also broken some of the relationships that people have with their own bodies. Now, that, in my view, that shouldn't be a big surprise. In fact, I'm a little surprised that it doesn't happen more often. And it's true that we are talking about it more. I think there is, there is, some, there is some social media, I think, has influenced this in ways that are not always helpful. Um, I wouldn't, you know, a friend of mine has written about it, calling it a social contagion. I think that's too strong. I don't, I don't think that's quite accurate. Uh, but I don't think we should, we, we shouldn't underestimate how social media um, has, you know, has made this more public and, and more acceptable. The, the treatments for once gender dysphoria is is identified the treatments range from things that are minimally invasive to completely life-changing and very difficult to reverse okay there's there's stuff that is fairly non non-invasive uh, certain types of cross-dressing things like that once you get into hormone therapies as a precursor to surgical options uh, you get you get mu you get much more in the life altering and ir irreversible types of treatments now here's the irony of this in my view is is sort of twofold and again hear me out because I, I i do th i do think gender dysphoria is a real thing but what's ironic about it is that life-altering treatments are being proposed for young girls while they are still in the midst of, a, of solidifying their own sense of gender identity. You know, while, while they're basically in the throes of puberty, which medically speaking, you know, physicians in here can bear me out, is probably the worst time in a girl's life to consider these kinds of life-altering treatments. I mean, that, that's one, I think, irony in this. A second irony is that it's treated, I think the gender dysphoria today in the culture is treated differently than almost anything else that adolescents tend to struggle with. Because for one, the, 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 the experience is taken, for, is, almost, is taken for granted as, as something that can't be questioned or, or raised questions about. And what, what I think is just particularly tricky about this is that in most cases, not, not all of them, but in, in lots of cases, there are underlying issues that have to do with the, the mental health of the person who is experiencing the gender dysphoria. So that, that, that though there are, there, there are times, I think, when gender dysphoria just sort of emerges on its own. But in the majority, in the majority of cases that I'm aware of, there's, there's something else that the gender dysphoria is a symptom of something deeper, not the deepest cause itself. And so to, to propose, again, the irony of this, to propose potentially life-altering treatments without addressing the underlying, what might be the underlying drivers for the gender dysphoria I think in, in lots of other fields of medicine would be considered something akin to malpractice. Now, a third, I guess a third irony in this is that statistically speaking, you know, if, if the person who experiences gender dysphoria is, is 
is basically left alone and not subject to life-altering treatments, in roughly 75% of cases, by the time they emerge into young adulthood from adolescence, the gender dysphoria basically disappears. Okay, now sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. And to be fair, in, in many cases, the gender dysphoria will, all, will give way to a same-sex attraction. But I, I guess my, the, the, the approach that I think is warranted in this is a cautious and waiting approach before engaging in potentially life-altering treatments. Okay, now the other thing besides, I mean, gender dysphoria is, is, is a thing. The other thing that's a thing, it's getting redundant, is detransitioning that we're seeing more and more of today. Now, in, in, lots of, in lots of cases, it's exceptionally difficult to do. And this is, this is, the, the, that's, this is in my view, the heartbreaking part of this, um, that people who, in their, in their view, prematurely underwent these life-altering treatments only to enter their 20s and have and come to regret that. That, that. that, I think, is part, is, is one of the things we're seeing as a result of um, what, what, I, what I think is, a, in many cases, a premature rush to treating a symptom before we get to treating the root causes. All right, so let me, let me stop there. We've got about 10 minutes or so. I want to open it up for, for questions here. And I do so with fear and trepidation. <laughs> questions? Maybe we should have that Slido app where people can f phone them in. <laughs> yes? Um, not so much a question, but more Please. Yeah. Say, say that last part again. They don't, they don't revert back to... I see. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. But the stand... The stand the, the, you, you were, did I hear you right? You said that the standard of care for that in the field is not something you agree with. Did I hear that correctly? Okay. All right. Other questions? Well, I guess we can close in prayer and go home. Go ahead in the back. Say that again. This is a, yeah, I knew somebody was going to say, ask this one. <laughs> I think there, there are two different ways to look at this. And I, I know, oh yeah, uh, the question was, what, what do you do with um, basically the request for to use someone's preferred pronouns? Okay. Now, I, I, the, there's two ways, I think two ways to think about this. Um, 
the, the Bible, I think, is pretty clear that God, God created male and female. And the, the, the gender binary is the way God created it. Um, and to, so to, 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 to go along with someone's preferred pronouns is, in the view of some, uh, reinforcing a narrative that's theologically not true. Um, the other way to view this, I think, is to say that if you want a relationship with a person and you refuse to, to use their preferred pronouns, the po- prospect of a relationship with them is probably off the table. And so if the goal is to win a person, it's, it's really tough to do that when a relationship is off the table. And so my inclination would be to opt for the relationship and, to, and in, in an attempt to win a person as opposed to winning, just winning an argument. Now, I recognize the cost of that, um, but as, as, I weigh, as I weigh that, that I think that, that's, that's what I would do. Not, not faulting anybody who sees it differently, uh, but that's my own preference. I'm following my, my friend Preston Sprinkle here on this, so I know some of you have had access to on that. Yes? Well, I think our, our, you know, our obligation is to accept people for where they are, but also, you know, we, we model that after the way the Savior treats us. You know, he, he accepts us as we are, but loves us too much to allow us to stay that way. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't preclude telling someone the truth, but doing it in a way that's loving and winsome and compassionate. Now, the, the, the trick with the, what makes this so countercultural today is that this disagreement is often seen as equivalent to hatred. And I think the, the best way to model that is to, to learn, we need to learn better to disagree well. And it starts here, where, where we, we can disagree with each other Within, within, within boundaries, of course, but we can disagree with each other and we can do it without you know, name calling or incivility or you know, anything like that. Typically what we've done in the past is when we disagree with someone, we state reasons for why we disagree. Uh, today we've, we've skipped that step and we go straight from disagreeing to some sort of name calling and other, other types of ad hominem arguments. Um, so that, that's, I think, how we, how we start with this. But I think there are, there are aspects of the culture that are, you know, are, are going to look at us the same way until we change our views. And, the, the, you know, we don't, have, we don't have the luxury of changing our views on things where the Bible is, re- is really clear. So I remember when I, when I saw... This wasn't that long ago. One of the most winsome people I know is Joel Osteen. I mean, he's just, I mean, that's, that's about all you can say about him. Um, but he, he, got, he was defending, you know, the traditional biblical view of marriage. And he got absolutely crucified. Uh, and it did it in a way that was winsome and pleasant. And I thought, if Joel Osteen, if this is happening to him, then... You know, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of the, the, the benefit of being winsome. That's not to say we don't do that, but I think there are, what that showed me was that people are going to, they're going to they're gonna view us this, the way that, that they do, not because of how we engage this, but because of the view that we hold. And that's different. You know, there I think we have to say, you know, we hold our views, we do it as winsomely as we can, but that's where we have to let the chips fall where they will. 
on that. And that, I, I think that, um, you know, that's just part, that's part of what the cultural cross we have to bear. Yes, sir. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but I'll, 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 I'll go, I'll go with it. There, there is a, we could have a tendency. You talked about earlier, and I think you draw the line with tendency or attraction to an action. Um, to the gender dysphoria and the point where someone starts some kind of hormone therapy. I think that's what you're saying. Would the act of initiating hormone therapy? eventually to other actions. Would the act of taking the hormone therapy be equivalent to acting on a attraction or you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. what, is, that, is that an act considered an action? That, that well yeah, that, that is considered an action. Right. Um, the question is, you know, what's our what's our moral assessment of that action? But that's so that yeah that's different than the the the, the, the attraction. Um, so that the actions are the things that we're held accountable for. That was my point. Okay, that's what, I just want to make yeah. sure I, I got that. Yeah, no, you. I wasn't sure. Yeah, we were no, you. Talking about can you reverse her or not? But yeah. I just want to make but taking yeah. the therapy is an action. That's correct. Yes, sir. So we'll make we're gonna make this the last one. Yeah. So the thing that as a dad and I want to stand up. I have kids there, and I we use a lot of these fancy words and whatever as well. But the point I want to get across is we're talking almost like it's a, a casual thing, it's a passive. But I, I want the students to realize that we are under attack. There are actually sinful people trying to encourage them to do the wrong thing. And all of what you're saying sounds good from a casual point of view, but as a parent and as a Christian, I, we gotta warn our kids I understand. people intentionally trying to destroy them. And can you say something as parents, what are we supposed to say? Because it is not the way the Bible has, as you said. But what else do we do proactively so we don't get silenced and pushed aside and told this is not the way? Can you comment from that stronger point of view, please? I think you said it pretty well. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure I can say it much better than that. Uh, so I think, yeah, yeah. I think we should close in prayer on, on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, especially, especially I think if you're parents, parents of daughters, especially this seems to be the, you know, who the majority of cases are. Um, no, that, I think the urgency with which you treat that, I think is right. Um, what I'd wanna be, what I wanna be sure of is that, um, is that the pa parents would continue to, to love their kids while they tell them the truth at the same time. And they would feel they would feel that sense that they are, you know, that, that they are still worthy of being loved and cared for, uh, while you tell them the truth at the same time, because one of the things that we've seen tends to drive people toward a, a lot a lot of negative things in their lives, not only related to sexuality, is the, is re reacting to environments that. Um, you know, did, did not allow people to, to have honest conversations about the things that they're going through. And that doesn't preclude us telling the truth, which we have to do. That's our obligation as parents to do that. But I want to make sure it's done in a way that keeps the relationship intact so that you actually have a basis for continuing those conversations in the future. What you said, I think, is right. And parents, you know, I, I mean, I know tons of parents, they're exasperated with not knowing what to do about this. Um, and you know, some, of the, some of the rules in the public schools, uh, I think, are not, are not contributing toward this being a good thing. So thank you, that's a good word. All right, good to be with you all. We need to stop here for now. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dan.
Just once again, thank you so much, Dr. Ray, for uh, this weekend and for um, everything the Lord has used you for this weekend. Um, yeah, to close out our time together, um, let's just go ahead and have one more final time of worship. Uh, will you all rise with me? Thank you, Adam, for leading us on that time of worship. I just want to thank you for joining us for our last session of our fall conference. Just want to go through uh, just uh, seven announcements that we have. I'll just go through them uh, just rather quickly. First of all, there's a prayer shawl ministry workshop this Saturday. And if you're interested in being a part of that, please contact Marilyn. Her email is listed in the announcement. 
Also, there's going to be free flu, flu shots offered next Sunday at the Hoffman Conference Center in the Torrance Memorial Complex. So if you're interested in, in some free flu shots, uh, please um, note, make a note of that and the times there for uh, that opportunity. Also, our um, mental health and uh, mental well-being, um, sorry, mental and um, emotional well-being for women, the six-week uh, uh, is going to six-week session is going to start again on October 15th. And so if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, please talk to Jackie Liu. Our missions conference is going to be occurring later this month, October 20th through the 22nd. We have the privilege of hearing from uh, um, from a speaker from, uh, from the Missio Nexus. His name is Ted Esler, and so we want to encourage you to attend and mark that on your calendars. Uh, the fifth uh, announcement is for our um, Harvest Festival, which is going to be occurring on Sunday, October 29th, uh, from the time of 2 to 5 p.m. in our East parking lot. So if you want to be a part of that and to serve, uh, please contact our Children's Minister, Faith. And also, for those who are interested in being baptized uh, during our Thanksgiving Sunday or the Sunday before Thanksgiving or becoming a member of our church, uh, please contact myself. Uh, our baptism membership classes will be held on the 5th and 12th of November. And finally, for those who are uh, joining us on, during the live stream, next week we're going to have our communion Sunday, so please have your elements prepared at home for a communion. At this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Dan uh, forward for to giving us of our uh, uh, prayer. Thanks, David. Let's go ahead and thank Adam, Sophia, and Kevin for leading us this morning. And let's go ahead and thank again Dr. Ray for being with us this weekend. So we recognize that we have just scratched the surface on some very critical issues uh, related to our lives, our relationships, our physical bodies, the way that we see ourselves. And I just want to say, you know, I appreciate Will and Allie and all of our counselors for our middle school and high school students, those that teach our students as well on Sunday. And students, we want you to know that we have your back, uh, we have your hearts, and we want God's uh, very best for you. And for all of us that used to be students uh, who are a little bit older on the spectrum, you know, our desire also is to be an example of godliness. And even in our own relationships, that we would model the kind of purity and holiness in our own relationships. Uh, so that the message that we deliver to the world uh, would really be seen through our students, through our adults, through our families and our individuals. And so we believe that God has made us male and female. And in his likeness, uh, we could reflect his glory to the world. So let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you especially for our students. Uh, thank you so much for their presence. And Lord, we recognize that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual forces of darkness. And so Lord, we know that the battles that our students that each and every one of us faces, that you've already won the victory through Jesus, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Father, our prayer is that as men and women, as male and female, that we would reflect the glory of your image to those around us. And Lord, we know that the struggles, that they are real, that they're deep and that we could easily feel the pressure of those around us to, to cave in and to collapse to sinful desires. But we pray that you would help us to make decisions that show that Jesus is stronger and he's greater and he is our ultimate pleasure. So Father, as a church, as a community of faith, we pray that you would be exalted in all that we desire, and in all that we decide. And Lord, as we struggle, we pray that we would come alongside, that we would support, and we would help each other follow after you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Yeah, thanks so much for being here. We love you guys and look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Why should I gain from his reward?